there were a lot. I, first of all, I just I think probably you should talk, tell people about the organization, how it came about, maybe how you got there. So um, I'm president of Ex Muslims of North America. It's the only ex Muslim organization in the United States, and I would say the only one of its kind in the world, where we're trying to build communities of ex Muslims, trying to empower ex Muslims. And the idea is to change the dynamic where ex Muslims are in the shadows. Um, I would say, much like atheists were a few centuries ago, where nobody spoke up. Um, there are lots of ex Muslims, and um, in order to secure your rights, you need to be out there. Um, so we run support communities, we do advocacy, we have, um, we've recorded uh, videos about. Um, the life of ex-Muslims in order to, for other ex-Muslims to understand that it's okay to speak out. Even after speaking out, you're okay. And um, we're doing a campus tour right now where we're going uh, to schools around the U.S. and Canada. And again, the idea is to make it normal to be an ex-Muslim, to be able to talk about religion without being accused of, um, say, far-right sentiments or uh, things along those lines where um, this the idea that we can't criticize Islam while standing up for the civil liberties of Muslims is something that is not in vision, generally, people don't understand that. There's a difference between the ideas and the people. The people are great. We need to stand up for the liberties. But we still also need to talk about the problems within the ideology. And so I, I, I'm getting ready. I'm going to London next weekend. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a really good chance, considering who I'm sitting on stage with, that topics surrounding this are going to come sure. up. Uh, Ex-Muslims North America obviously focuses on North America. Is there a UK European branch or similar organizations that are and, and how much do the missions overlap between them? So um, for the situation in every country is different, so what they're doing is slightly different. So um, we sort of advertise that we do meetups and uh, try to get people to come. In the UK, there, the situation is a lot more tense. There are a lot more extremists there, so they don't advertise it. They do occur, but they're more underground. Um, from an advocacy perspective, there's CMB with Mariam Nawazi. They do advocacy-related work. Um, similarly, there's a bunch of advocacy groups in Germany, in France, in Singapore. And then there are uh, a lot of underground communities in pretty much every country, in Pakistan, in Jordan, in Egypt. So they're a bit under the radar, obviously, because in a lot of those countries, you'll be killed just for speaking out. But they exist everywhere. Wherever you have Muslims, you'll find a decent amount of ex-Muslims there, too. So one of the things that I, I want to understand a little better, um, in in the process, is you're working towards atheism, or towards Ex-Muslim normalcy. Yeah. Um, primarily for non-believers, or I mean, would that We're also focusing include on non-believers? Like uh, the idea initially that we started was that people that are leaving and becoming, say, Christian or Baha'i or other faiths, they have other outlets. Right. And people that are atheists generally are completely alone. So we wanted to provide community for them and empower them. But from the standpoint of Islam, does it matter that much if you leave Islam yeah. and become an atheist or a Christian or a Buddhist? You can't or, walk away. Yeah, you're done. Yeah. Um, and and we you know we kind of say that with a smile, but there's a there's a difference between Muslims in Dearborn, Michigan, who are doing reality shows and getting tattoos, and, and then Muslims in the UK who, um, I have friends in the UK who are absolutely terrified that there's this uh, attempt to impose Sharia law and, the, and a gradual takeover, that the UK is going to fall to Islam in the, in the near future. I don't know how seriously you take those claims, but dealing with Muslim, Muslims and ex-Muslims in non Islamic countries yeah. is fundamentally different from how it has to be dealt with in, in you know, in Iran or Pakistan or Jordan or where they've got it, you know, where they're entrenched in the government and the religion. Yeah, so over there, you can't speak up in the way you can over here. So from my perspective, having the privilege over here that the government isn't persecuting us, it's sort of incumbent upon us to stand up and demand change over here. So um, Muslims need to stand up for the rights of minorities within their communities, which are ex-Muslim or gay people. but. Um, that change can't happen over there because you get murdered. Um, in uh, Pakistan right now, over this past year, they've been persecuting atheists, they've been arresting them, and they've been uh, finding them on Facebook, and um, somebody I knew was arrested and tortured, and he hasn't been heard of in six months. And that's not an uncommon uh, occurrence. So there are people who view this as um, an issue of reform. You know, because if you're in the West and you are at least passingly familiar with the way Christianity uh, has worked and changed, I mean, you had Christians who were basically running around murdering whatever non-Christians, including Muslims and anybody else. Um, you had periods of time where the church was either explicitly or implicitly in charge of the government. And during those times, dissent wasn't tolerated. Sure. And it took... 
um, you know, the Protestant Reformation and stuff like that, to to build a more enlightened culture that valued individual, you know, free speech and free expression and, and, the, and the sanctity of beliefs. But the first thing we had to do was get to a point where we stopped killing people who just disagreed with us. Yeah. Now, how do you make those first steps in countries that are just absolutely controlled by, you know, Islam? You first need to convince the people on the ground, the Muslims that are there that support us, that what they're supporting is wrong and immoral. And if you're coming at it from a religious perspective, from a, it is moral from a religious perspective. So you need to shake people loose of how, uh, how deeply they care about the religion, how sure they are of the validity of all the claims they're making. So a rise of atheism within Muslim countries goes a long way. Um, having people that you personally know that are atheists lowers the bar of you wanting to kill somebody over it. So while there are a lot of people that want to speak out, and we get emails from people every day from around the world, um, empowering them to speak out and empowering the ones over here to speak out. And largely, it's a matter of changing opinions of people about what is moral and what is not moral and pulling away the idea that uh, morality, need, or at least government, needs to derive from religious texts. Um, going back to what you were saying about the European side of it and the uh, Christian side of it, there are different religions, so there are differences right there. Sure. Within Islam, dissent is far less tolerated, and it's part of because Islam came after Christianity. Um, it's a part of it that other religions are wrong, and changing religions even slightly is wrong. Um, innovation is a bad word, things like that. So um, it's much harder to push for change. And within Christianity, it's more of an inspired by God. Mm. Um, within Islam, it is a literal word of God. God actually relayed that word, so there is no room for changing anything. Um, so it's a fundamentally different, uh, from my perspective, concept of wanting to reform Islam. From my, again, from my perspective, it's easier to just get people to walk away because if you take an, something 100% seriously and you show that there are flaws, this is wrong in some way, scientifically, morally, women's rights, whatever, it's much easier to walk away. Very rarely have I found somebody that was a, a conservative uh, uh, Muslim that found the flaws and said, I will be a reform Muslim, I will be a liberal Muslim. When they see a flaw, they walk away. This is similar to a point that I made many times over several years that literal fundamentalist Christians yeah. who believe that the earth is six to 12,000 years old and blah, blah, blah. The foundation is so rigid that when you start to chip away at it, they are more likely to fall away and become atheists. Exactly. The liberal, moderate Christians have kind of already dealt with those issues and, oh, it's metaphor and this isn't to be taken seriously. And so it's much harder to attack. Exactly. Do we, do we have... Any, I mean, you're saying you don't tend to see that, but do we have, I mean, apart it's from a, the guys in Dearborn, do we have liberal, moderate? Even the, I wouldn't agree with a part about Dearborn. So um, a lot of people that are outwardly not practicing to that extent still believe in it. So um, if somebody's drinking, they will say that drinking is wrong and immoral, but I'm too weak of a person. Okay. Um, I had a friend that um, put on the hijab and took it off. And then uh, when I asked her, why did you take it off? If it is the word of God and it is the truth, and her response was, I, I'm too weak, I can't do this. This is the right and moral thing to do, I just can't do it. So there's a very different distinction between saying that this thing is wrong, and that is why I don't care, versus I am wrong, and I'm doing it anyways. Ah. So that, that raises a couple of concerns, because we've had people call into the show from the UK who are terrified that Islam is getting ready to take over the UK. And then there are the arguments that are often made of, oh, well, you know, uh, practicing Muslims in countries that aren't Islamic, they're all great and nice until they actually get control and then everything goes to hell. If, but the, the, the point that I want to get to here is when we talk about what people believe and what they say they believe and then what they do, yeah. those are sometimes three different things, not yeah. just within Islam, but anywhere. Yeah. Um, we know, you, you, you came out with some statistics yesterday in your talk, we know in um, Islamic countries, how many people are in favor of uh, stoning adulterers and et cetera? And it, you, I don't know if you had that number off the so top. So one, 91% uh, of Muslims in Pakistan are pro-religious law. Like the government shouldn't be based on religious law. 76% believe that um, people that leave Islam, people like us, basically should be killed. So those are the people that are literally advocating for the murder of other people. How many of those will be the moderates that will stand up and push back? I'm willing to bet that's a very small number. Yeah, so if it's, if it's 71% say they believe that uh, apostates should be killed, 
which we were talking about earlier. It no. seems to be consistent with at least my understanding of the Quran and many others. Now, there's 71% who say they're in favor of that. What percentage of those people are saying it because they can't say the opposite for fear of their own life? And what percentage of those people who uh, say it and believe it would actually support enacting it and participate? Do, do... Um, the people that would participate is generally lower because it's a human thing. When taking a life, you're, you, don't, you understand that it's wrong in some way at a deep human level. So I would say that a good chunk of those won't actually do it. But even if it's, say, 10% that would actually do it, you're talking about 7.5% of 200 million people. Right. So it's a massive number. That's just in Pakistan, not around the world. And if those are the ones that are predominantly in control of things, yeah. it almost doesn't matter, you know, if my grandmother is exactly. never going to kill somebody, uh, but she's supporting a government and a regime that would. The other thing is that, the, um, generally speaking, if uh, you're pushing back against that, so say there's 7.5% that would actually do it, and 7.5% that say that this is wrong, those seven and a half percent uh, that say it's wrong don't have the language or ability to, to really push back because they have to uh, navigate the waters of apostasy and blasphemy laws themselves. Right. And even pushing back against that, you're saying that the Quran is wrong or Islam is wrong. So the tools they have available to push back are very limited. So I guess this gets to, to a couple things because I love the fact that uh, your organization is focused primarily on ex-Muslim normalcy. And, and advocacy, and you guys do videos, and you do in different languages, and you have different reach. Um, um, we've, we're doing them in English, but we're subtitling them in different languages. I would think that maybe the long-term goal is to get enough out, open, ex-Muslims in the North America area that we can not only educate non-Muslims about these issues, yeah. uh, but maybe hopefully get inroads even to places where where, where we're censored, where they're not going to show, uh, you, you know, you can't have access to YouTube videos. You're not going to get, you know, fair and honest news reporting. Um, how, what, what is your view of how long it takes to, to get there? They, and, and I ask this because people ask me all the time, when's religion going to go away? Well, that's even a bigger issue. Yeah. My concern, I, I'd love for all ridiculous beliefs to go away and all harmful beliefs to go away. But I can... I live in a country where even the most extreme fundamentalist of any religion um, can't enact the sort of violence and, yeah. and um, censorship and, and, and murder of people who disagree. That's not true elsewhere. I, I, I'm still not, I don't know how we get over that hump a little bit. If so one bit of context we need to keep in mind is that it's been, it took, the protest for reformation was five centuries ago, exactly five centuries. So it took five centuries for us to get here. And in between, you had massive wars. Millions of people died talking about ideology and the issues within ideology that provoked those wars. Um, it won't be an easy journey. We need to understand that it won't happen overnight either. Um, we um, need to push for more people to speak out and to have more of these issues. But we need to understand that it will, this is a project of, in the order of decades, if not centuries. Sure. And we need to have that kind of patience and understand that we need um, to side with the people that are standing up for the values we believe in, free speech, um, human rights, women's rights, whatever those values that are that are dear to us. It's not simply a matter of um, going back to the Dearborn Muslims, that they um, are in fashion shows or they're um, drinking or whatever. Are they standing up for the rights of everybody, even people that they, they deeply oppose? So as an ex-Muslim, I'm happy to stand up for the right of somebody to advocate against ex-Muslims or, or even the people that advocate that, uh, the idea that ex-Muslims should be killed. As long as they're not actually doing the violence, they have the right to say whatever they want. And we need to get to a point where Muslims are standing up and saying that I stand for the right of apostates to talk about Islam and uh, talk about why they believe it is wrong and harmful. So I'm, I'm going to throw you a, a, a kind of a little curveball here that, you know, who knows how this will go. What are we doing wrong? And how can we do it better in, in dealing with this? And I don't just mean like um, former Southern Baptists, yeah. but I mean the world. We're living in a time where um, the President of the United States has a, it's something that's been called a Muslim ban. I don't know if it's yeah. fair to call it. May, maybe, who knows? Where? But there's lots of conversations. And we talk about Islamism, Islamophobia. We talk about whether or not it's racist, uh, even if we're going after an ideology. Um, give me your thoughts on how to fix all of the ways we're doing it wrong so that we can maybe do it better together. So uh, one of the things is that um, on the right and the left, we're doing it wrong. Um, I would say the vast, vast majority of people are doing it wrong. And on the right, obviously, banning people based on the bad ideas they hold won't make those bad ideas go away. At worst, you can say that we're 
um, pushing the problems out to the world, and we ourselves won't be effective because there's nobody here. But we already have, what, uh, three or four million Muslims that live in America. Um, the bigger issue is that we need to change people's minds. We need to engage those ideas and point out why certain parts of those ideas are false or wrong. And um, in order to do that, we need to have these public, open conversations and honest conversations. Um, so when President Obama said that Islam is the religion of peace, that was a lie. Um, if I said Christianity was a religion of peace, that would also be a lie. Yeah. Religions are much more complex than it is a religion of anything. Um, so we're willing to throw these platitudes because um, we want to be nice regardless of reality, regardless of truth. And uh, that makes the job of people that are trying to change things harder. Um, Islam has a bloody past, same as Christianity, same as, um, I would say, any part of the world, no matter um, where you go. If you go back a few centuries, you will find horrific things happening because that was the state of humanity. And in the Muslim world, due to the fact that state power is intermingled with the religious power, they're able to whitewash all of that. You don't know anything about it. From a personal perspective, I'm from Pakistan. Um, in 1971, Pakistan and, uh, had a civil war, and half the country broke off into Bangladesh. In that civil war, about 3 billion people were murdered. It was a genocide. I grew up in Pakistan. I did not know about it. We were never taught about it. Never happened. Nothing. I learned about it later on the internet that, OK, this is the thing. Then I met Bangladeshi people that were obviously upset at Pakistan because of what happened. So if you can control the truth to such an extent, change can't happen. And by us not willing to talk about the problems, we're making it worse. So when Obama says Islam is the religion of peace, or when um, newspapers refuse to cover the problems within Islam, they're aiding and abetting censorship. They're aiding and abetting uh, the problems within Islam, from my perspective. Apart from a really slow sort of slow burn in infiltration, yeah. Uh, we don't see we see this problem not just with Islamic countries. We see this with uh, you know authoritarian regimes like in North Korea, yeah. where you basically don't have access to the information. You're not going to find out what the rest of the world knows. And let's say you you live in one of those places and they start giving uh, like government approved internet access. Yeah. Um, we already know that you can throw somebody in a lab coat. And people think they're a doctor, and you should listen to them. And yeah. we know that there's a gazillion websites out there that are legitimately fake news in the sense that they look like they're a news source, but they're mm -hmm. actually putting out bad information. If the governments are in these positions of control, apart from a slow burn where you, we get this gradual change from within, which would seem to take almost forever because you're bucking you know, a status quo um, where you can even be convinced that you live in the perfect yeah. land because you've been been lied to about what perfect yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Um, if and what's the likelihood that actually armed conflict is necessary and would it actually change anything? From my perspective, it's not necessary. I ha I'm a bit of an optimist. I believe in the better na angels of our, our nature. So... Um, I have seen people change just by argumentation very rapidly within the course of months. And there's no reason that wouldn't happen in the Muslim world as well. Um, the ish and the good and bad thing is a lot of the Muslim world is not technologically advanced or rich enough to in have those kinds of controls. Mm -hmm. So in Pakistan, they want to uh, prevent, say, somebody from drawing Muhammad. So they banned this site or that site. They at one point banned Facebook. At another point, they banned Twitter. But there are too many sites. There are too much on the internet. And they don't have the resources to do a blanket ban. And they do read the news. They do read international sources. Um, and um, it changes their opinion. So if we were talking about it honestly, and we talked about uh, certain issues that happened in the past, they would read about them. They would think that we were wrong and um, were lying about it. But they can look them up themselves. So even within the Islamic text, the Islamic histories attest to all of these things. So we just need to point and say, look at it yourself. So I have, I have a thought. and. This may be a fantasy. But if you could set up a website that constantly redirected such that it would be difficult to block, what would be, do you think there's any benefit in perhaps doing uh, an information campaign, like fly over and just drop leaflets everywhere <laughs> that point everybody to this website um, that the government can't do anything about? So honestly, I don't think the government is the biggest issue regarding this. The bigger, bigger issue is that having the conversations at all so um, most, uh, I, I would say Saudi Arabia and Iran are good at blocking uh, information from getting in, but there are about 50 other countries that are around. They can get the information directly. So um, a lot of ex Muslims that I know left because of atheist talks and atheist books. Um, I was mentioning that Richard Dawkins' book was translated into Arabic unauthorized, and 10 right. million people downloaded it. Um, so 
as long as we're pushing honestly against what the issues are, the information will get there. Um, we just need to be speaking about it more, and we need to stop empowering dishonest Muslims. So if a, a significant percentage of Muslims are conservative enough that they want to defend their religion over human rights, that's the rhetoric you're going to get. If hijab is, for example, normalized as the good thing within Muslim communities, the people that Muslim communities will push forward are going to be the people that agree with that and push that narrative forward. Um, we can evaluate the idea that um, women need to be covered up is a bad idea in the sense of the bottom line is women need to do whatever they want to do. Right. Um, so we can push back against all of these narratives that are being pushed out without needing to be a Muslim, without needing to be anything. Um, when we're looking at uh, the Mormon church and po uh, polygamy within the por uh, Mormon church, we don't need to be a Mormon to understand why this is wrong. Right. So most of these things are very objective and you can look at them and you can point out why they're wrong and you can promote what the truth is. Um, for whatever sad reason in the West, a lot of people that are being promoted are people that are trying to defend Islam instead of trying to defend Muslims. Yeah. And so just for the people who are watching, uh, yes, I'm asking questions that I may already know Muhammad's answer to, but it's, it's for your benefit because there's frustration all, all around. There's frustration on when are the bad ideas, whether it comes from Islam or Christianity or Scientology or Hinduism or whatever, when are they going to go away? How quickly is religion going to be gone? Is it going to, ha you know, going to end in our lifetime? And then there's a darker side to this where, um, oh, we don't need to spend any time worrying about you know, encroachment of Christianity in the United States uh, because Islam is the greatest threat worldwide. And I, and I, I'll let you chime in on this because I've pointed out that um, while it may be the case that Islam is the greatest threat worldwide, that doesn't mean that it's the greatest threat in Austin, Texas, or in sure. my living room, or wherever. And even if it were, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, my resources can only be devoted to the thing that's the biggest threat. From your perspective, given that we have terror attacks and people are uh, you know, Obama was afraid to say radical Islamic terrorist and, and other people are using that to basically take every brown person and, you know, make them yeah. the new enemy. How, it, uh, where are we on the clock uh, of danger <laughs> from Islam? Because w when we get people, callers, there was a caller a month or so ago, or maybe two, um, who was basically warning Americans that we were all too naive and that his country was going to hell in a handbasket because of how they were dealing with Islam. I don't know how much of that's accurate. I'm not convinced that it could happen here, but I've had people, including ex-Muslims, who say that it essentially can happen here because you don't have to change the government. You don't have to change the Constitution. You build up little pockets where you're implementing your stuff and eventually the police are afraid to go there and then it spreads and spreads. How much, how much danger is there versus how much are we amplifying danger? And, and is talking about the danger itself more of a problem than just encouraging good ideas? And I wouldn't say it's a problem talking about the danger, so I, about being accurate. So it's very easy to uh, be hyperbolic in either direction, where people say there is no problem, everything is wonderful, and then people say that everything is horrible, the world's about to come to an end, yesterday was the end of the world, that sort of rhetoric. So we need to be careful that we're talking about the truth, but there are obviously are issues. So if, for example, um, you have 10% uh, of a population, regardless of which specific interest group it belongs to, there will be a significant political pressure to cater to the desires of that uh, group, whatever it may be. And regardless of what Islam is or isn't, when you have a certain percentage of the population that are defending that idea um, and are putting pressure on politicians to conform to that, you will have less of a pushback. Um, the government spending can be modified, things like that will happen. So um, we need to be careful of that because that is... Um, common in any, any government, any de that's, a, I would say, a flaw of democracy. On the one hand, yes, we depend upon people, but on the other hand, people can distort government too. So I'm not as concerned about Muslims coming up and doing things as, as that people, in order to win their vote, start doing things. Well, the question that, that was listed here was they wanted to discuss Christianity versus Islam in Africa. And, and I don't know, because you're focused on North America stuff, but you have, you're tuned to the pulse of a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't know what his question is. If you had something that you wanted to mention with regard to Islam in Africa, uh, go for it. So a little controversial perhaps, but often we talk about how um, the West, uh, from a Christian perspective, is affecting Africa and uh, say 
the issue of gay rights, things like that. We're, we're pushing evangel evangelicals are pushing Christian ideology into Africa and are damaging the local countries over there. Mm. The same thing is happening from another direction from an Islamic side too. A lot of African countries that were more liberal 30, 40 years ago have, it, have had an influx of billions of dollars coming from Gulf countries, coming from Islamic countries that are trying to radicalize them. And they have succeeded to a great extent. Um, I have many friends that are from Somalia. And um, if you talk to them about their parents, their parents' generation was very liberal um, outwardly at the very, very least. And um, within their generation, it has changed completely. Everybody covers, everybody, uh, nobody talks against Islam. Um, music does not really exist in that way anymore. Um, and within 30, 40 years, the environment changed the same way. So it's not just that Christians are pushing bad ideas into Africa, so are Muslims. And some of it is also about poverty. So if there's a poor country, it's easy to control them by spending money on there. So I, I'm not a fan of internet memes, the little graphics with, you know, here's something. Sure. Uh, because I think that they oversimplify things. And, and while they can, on occasion, be, you know, really good starting points mm -hmm. for a conversation, I think too many people view them as like the end of the conversation. Yeah. And I've seen some memes. Uh, you had uh, a slide during your talk, uh, which I really liked, but it reminded me of another one that I'd seen where it was, I think it was a, a women's football team uh, from 30, 40 years ago, and then the one from now. Yeah. And in 30, 40 years ago, they're not covered, and now they're completely covered. You, you talk, uh, talked about this, you know, we were just talking about Africa. Um, is it a correct perception that there's been, a re in a relatively short time worldwide, a massive shift back to more conservative views? Yes, um, across the board in every Muslim country that I've read about or know people from. Um, and it started, I think, in the 70s. Um, there were various dominoes, unrelated in my opinion, that went down. The, um, a lot of it was there was tension between Arab nationalism and Islamism. And Arab nationalism, Egypt was a champion of Arab nationalism. And that sort of fell after their war with Israel. They lost twice. And they lost their, uh, their prestige in the world. And as a result, Islamism became more popular. And then you had the Iranian revolution happen. And similarly in Pakistan, this uh, genocide that I mentioned. And, and for clarity, because we've mentioned Islamism twice, we probably ought to define it so that it's distinct, so that, you know. The, yeah, the idea basically that uh, your state should be modeled on Islam, um, that law should conform to Islam, that Islam is, to put in the words of the Muslim Brotherhood, the answer. So uh, basically a, a difference between uh, something you practice at home versus something that you're pushing outward to the state. Okay. And I didn't mean to interrupt you. By all means, can continue there. That this, this recent change, and you're saying this is, this is essentially in every Muslim country. Yeah. We've seen this. And that there's a bunch of different factors. Are there ways to perhaps identify some of those factors and try to correct for them Apart from just changing minds, which yeah. I'm, I'm, trust me, let's let's change everybody's mind and let's have conversations. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not into punching people or advocating sure. violence or anything. But if like, if if we knew that this was like one of the key dominoes, is there any chance to to find those out and perhaps repair them to fundamentally change relationships between countries? Um, I don't think so. Not in that way. In the sense that um, Saudi foreign policy is based on exporting Islam because that gives them more prestige. So we can work on isolating Saudi Arabia, but until that happens, they, that is their foreign policy. They will keep implementing that. We can't really stop that. Um, the other thing that needs to be kept in mind is that a lot of these countries are spending tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions dollars, of dollars around the world trying to um, increase conservatism. And it's working. And we aren't doing that. And there's no, ex-Muslims aren't powerful enough to counter that kind of money. So we, free thinkers or um, anybody else that uh, is m motivated to fight back against a conservative Islam need to help uh, empower groups that are doing this. Um, even within the US, um, uh, Saudi Arabia has invested tens of billions of dollars in colleges um, in various Islamic departments. And if you read a lot of those publications, they tend to be very apologistic, uh, defending Islam. So that's a viable way you can infiltrate academia by spending money. and. Other groups do that too. You have Liberty University, sure. you have other universities. So um, if we're not at least even trying to push back, both by pointing out where the flaws are or matching their expenditures, we will lose that argument. And, and not to um, rile up the conspiracy theorist base that is maybe watching these yeah. clips, um, what about something like the United Nations? Now, their Human Rights Council has been just 
an embarrassment. And the, the, some of the greatest human rights violators are on the human rights committee. Saudi Arabia was the president of the council. Yeah, and you know we can talk about all day long about how the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are allies and how we're you know essentially propping up this stuff. If if in this fictional utopia that I want to create, yeah. the United Nations actually built up and did human rights correctly, would imposing sanctions on those countries, would, um, is there anything that they could potentially even do? Or is, or is this idea of having a United Nations take on human rights essentially useless? That it, it's, it, you know, all these non-binding resolutions yeah. and the countries who want to participate can, is there anything they could even hope to do? I don't think do? the United Nations is powerful enough. Like individual governments are powerful enough and when they support a direction the United Nations is taking, then action can happen. But if there's no government backing what the UN wants, the UN is just bureaucrats. They can't do anything. Um, so if we want to back a certain foreign policy initiative that lines up with what we want in these issues, we can. So um, going back to this free speech, so Muslim, a lot of Muslim countries, if not all of Muslim countries, um, have blasphemy laws and pushing back and said right. we can put sanctions, we can make lives for people that do certain things difficult. We can also technologically help them. We can create technology and make technology available to dissidents where they can speak out with a government that can't monitor them. Instead, we're selling them in the equipment to monitor their people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, we want to get on to some callers here in a minute, but first of all, give everybody information on how they can contact you, uh, how, how they can find out about Access Muslims of North America, and if they're not in North America, because the show people are watching all around the world, um, what recommendations you'd have for, like, you know, if you're, a, if you're an atheist blogger in Bangladesh, yeah. what the hell do you do? Who, who do you reach out to? First off, you stay safe. If you're in a Muslim country, stay safe, stay anonymous, unless you're extremely confident and you can get away in a bad situation. So there are people that are dual nationals, for example. They have the privilege that if something bad happens, they can run away. If you're a, a local, you won't have that privilege. Um, so above all, I would say be safe, but speak out. The more you write, the more, um, everybody in every local situation has more of a pulse on what's going on in their country. So if there are protests in Bangladesh related to something, and if you're writing about that, and how that relates to Islam, that's not something I can't do over here. I don't have that context. So we need people in every country speaking out. Um, I was mentioning on our end, we're doing a campus tour. Um, you can read about it at exmuslimtour.com. Um, our own organization's website is exmna.org. And I'm available on Twitter if you have any questions. Mo the Atheist is my Twitter handle. 